If you've been watching photography on YouTube for a while, you will almost certainly have been told that you must do this, whilst another guy is telling you you must do that. There's a lot of mixed messages out there and it's confusing. So I thought what I'd do in this video is to unpick some of those common contradictions to try and bring some clarity to the world. So if you've been following some of the more well-known landscape photographers, you will have seen these amazing adventures and journeys they go on where they travel to these far-reaching beautiful places and as you continue to view these pictures and watch their adventures it almost suggests that in order to be a great landscape photographer or travel photographer or wildlife photographer then you have to travel to these places and that simply is not true. You do not need to travel to become really good at landscape photography. Almost all of us have some sort of nature just outside our door. So take a walk out, you'll see a tree in your street. You might be lucky enough to live on the border of a national park or just an hour or so drive away from a national park. Travel to these exotic locations is just absolutely not required. There's a lot to be said for shooting locally as you sort of start to hone your craft around your local area. You get out and you see these areas in the most beautiful uh, possible way and you put a spin on that location with your connection to that location that no one else can. So you don't need to travel, but also you do need to travel at times because if you do, you will end up with some fantastic locations. Even just going to like the Lake District, they say you point your camera in any direction and you get a good picture. So yeah, the contradiction there for travel, you don't need to travel, but at the same time, you'll get good pictures if you do. So the next couple of contradictions are kind of gear related and the first one being the tripod. Now you quite often get some photographers saying oh I don't use a tripod and it's kind of almost like virtue signaling they're somehow better at landscape photography because they're not using a tripod and that's simply not true. There are times when you do need a tripod particularly if you want to do things like long exposure the tripod will also help you to just slow down because once your camera's on the tripod in position you can kind of relax take that moment to really take in that landscape and form your artistic vision in a way where you're not so much worrying about what the camera's doing and once you find a good composition your camera is then locked in that place and you can fiddle around with the settings until you get it right without adjusting the actual composition on the other hand you potentially will miss opportunities if your camera is sat on the tripod. So there are times when it's very reasonable and it's a great thing to do just doing handheld photography. If you're going to do handheld photography though, I just recommend that you get the settings right and try not to rely too much on image stabilization. I think the best thing to do when you're hand holding is to get a shutter speed that is going to remove any motion that you have. So that's gonna be different for everyone. For me, I know I can get steady shots at 1 125th of a second or faster. If I go below that, I will often end up with blurry images and I never want to rely on the image stabilization in my lens or my camera. So if I want to shoot a landscape at f11, 1 125th of a second, I'm then just going to raise that ISO to get the exposure right for that. And you can come away even, I mean, in bright conditions, your ISO is still going to be pretty low. Cameras are great at handling noise these days, so I just recommend that you remove movements or shake with shutter speed rather than IS. You'll end up with much more usable and consistent results doing that. Right, the next one is filters. And the consensus quite often seems to be that you must have filters to be taken seriously as a landscape photographer. Now, that's absolutely not true especially when it comes to gradient filters where we're darkening the sky off to get an even exposure. They are not necessary now because you can just bracket and do it in post-production. That's what I do, but equally you can use them and it's, it's still a very justifiable use of filters and some people like to get that exposure right within the camera. It's just totally personal preference. But I would say that about... 70% of my images don't use any filters. The circular polarizer can be very useful to take that glare off the water and put a bit more punch in a, a blue cloudy sky, but we'll definitely need filters if you want to do long exposures usually. There are a few things where you can do multiple exposures, but I'm not interested in that. 
I will use filters, solid ND filters, to create my long exposures. They're very useful for that. But like I said, 70% I'm probably doing it without filters. That remaining 30, I am using filters. So you absolutely don't need them, but in certain circumstances, they can be very useful. So the next one is the golden hour. That's the hour after the hour just after sunrise and the hour just before sunset. A lot of landscape photographers will only shoot in that period because that's when we get that beautiful golden light that lights up that landscape with that warm, beautiful light and just gives us those incredible images. Now that is a fantastic time to shoot. However, I know a lot of people can't achieve that if they've got busy lives or they're in the summer and they don't want to stay out hugely late. Again, it's just not the case. You don't just need to shoot at that time. Yes, there are certain conditions where it's better than others, but I'm a big fan of just going out and shooting all day, particularly in the middle of the day if it's overcast or cloudy. You get that beautiful flat light and it just gives you opportunities to create beautiful images. This one here, for example, which I shot the other week, I had some light coming in from behind me, but then I've got a cloudy scene in front of me and it just created this beautiful scene. This was shot about two and a half hours before sunset and I'm absolutely thrilled with this image. You can shoot it anytime, but at the same time, yes, you'll get great shots in the golden hour. So the next one is the distance from the car. We all need to get to these beautiful locations and there are some people out there that will say it's not landscape photography if you have to go further than 100 yards from the car and then there's those who will also say the opposite you need to get out and into the landscape away from the car to genuinely experience it now i particularly like doing that second thing but there is absolutely it's not a requirement to get good shots yes you're more likely to get places or get scenes that others have not seen before if you go off exploring but you can still create superb images and unique images just by going very close to the car it also makes it a much easier day without that sort of physical element to it and that is very important for some people who aren't quite as mobile and it has been for me recently with my bad back so you can get great images it doesn't really matter whether you go far away from the car or not it's just especially photography wise it's just kind of it's deciding what type of day you want to have do you want to have an adventurous side of the day or do you purely want to focus on the photography the next one is post-processing now it's almost impossible to do digital photography without some kind of post-processing whether you're using an, app an application like lightroom to do it yourself or you allow the camera to do it in a jpeg it's always going on so there's no contradiction there really, but some people will say that they like to get it right in camera. Some people do more post-production. Don't really mind, it's totally up to you. It's a totally subjective thing. All I would say is this, it might be an idea to sort of decide what type of landscape photographer that you are. Do you want to keep things as natural as possible? That's certainly how I feel for my work because I think the world is beautiful as it is. So I'm not interested in swapping skies out. On the other hand though, I don't have any problem with people that do that. And I think there's some amazing composite images out there. The only thing I would say, and I've talked about this before, is that I don't want to be deceived as the viewer of an image by being tricked into believing that something or a scene is real when it's absolutely not. It's a fine line, I guess, but uh, it's down to you to decide. That's just how I feel. Next up, we have the weather. Now, I come across a lot of people who are new to landscape photography who have this kind of idea in their mind of doing landscape photography at sunset on a beautiful summer's evening with amazingly colourful skies. Now, that does happen sometimes, but a much more common day, especially here in the UK, it's going to be overcast, you're going to get rain, you're going to get high wind, all that kind of thing. And if you are going to be exploring this landscape photography journey, I would really encourage you to get used to shooting in those bad weather conditions because when the weather changes, we all know amazing things can happen. What I would say though, just on that point, is that the wind, if it's high wind, it just, it does kill to some extent the enjoyment of being outside. So I try to avoid the wind when I can. I don't think it, I can't think of too many instances where that helps your photography. Right, back to the gear. The next one is this sort of idea that you must own a good camera. We kind of get into this 
way of just buying gear to encourage us to go out there and do it, but sometimes that can go too far and we spend too much money on gear that we don't particularly need. You do not necessarily need a good camera in order to do landscape photography. I have still got my Canon 5D Mark II. You can pick these up so cheaply now on the used market and it's a full frame camera. It's still an amazing camera. Cameras have been superb at doing stills for a very long time now and this will be perfect for landscape photography for a long time to come. A lot of the camera manufacturers now are just fighting over video because they know they've been doing stills for a very long time. I also quite recently, or last year now, did a video about shooting landscape photography with a mobile phone and some little lens attachments. And this is one of the images I captured and ended up printing it. And I'm still really, really happy with that image. This is an A3 print. You could easily hang that on your wall and it looks great. On the other hand, the contradiction here being that if you start to look closely at this picture, you can start to see some of that lack of detail and sharpness that comes with shooting with a slightly smaller sensor. So there are times where you may need that high resolution for landscape photography. I used the Fujifilm GFX 100, 100 megapixel camera the other week. I blew that print up really big. And with a print that big at that resolution, you can get in really close and still see that very fine detail. With all your gear decisions, it always comes down to what I term as the problem solving desire budget triangle. So what problem do you need your camera to solve? What's your budget? And then you can let a little bit of desire creep into that as well. And by getting a balance of all those three things, you will get just the right gear for you at that time. Before we move on, I just quickly wanted to let you know you can now get a seven day free trial to the Raw Room, which includes full access to my Landscape Photography Masterclass. All you need to do is just head over to firstmanphotography.com slash Raw Room, stick your details in, sign up, and you can get that seven day free trial. I'd love you to check it out. I think you will love it. Right, the next one, I'm not even sure this is a contradiction to be honest, but I wanted to mention it because recently I was watching a photographer and he was sort of stating the obvious, saying that you can't control the weather. And I was thinking, yeah, of course you can't. But then I thought, actually, actually, can't we? Because if we go back to thinking about shooting locally and the weather, I'll give you an example to, to highlight this. I go to this spot overlooking Rosebury Topping near where I grew up very, very often. And I know that stood in that location with that composition, I can adjust that image. So I know that in the, uh, in the summer that the sun is going to be over towards the right hand side of my image. If I'm shooting in the midwinter, I know the sun's going to be off to the left and I can control by attending at the right time of year exactly where the sun is in my image. I can also do the same with the weather because I'm shooting locally. I can go to that place very, very often. So I know it's going to be a foggy day. I can go there if the, if the forecast is right for that. If it's going to be a beautiful sunset, that can be the image I get on that day. You're not always going to win. It's not always going to work, but by going there over and over again and trying to make the very most of that location, we essentially can control the sun and we can control the weather within that final frame that we come up with. Yes, it takes some hard work, but it can be done. Might need to be lucky as well, but it can be done. One of the things I'm always trying to do is just to encourage you to uh, sort of experiment and play with it yourself. Yes, listen to all these different bits of information, but then try and formulate your own way of creating and shooting your images because by doing that, it'll be the most satisfying and you've got the best chance of creating something unique and interesting. Just one note, I'm going to be at the photography show next week. I'll be hanging out with the guys at Loop Deck. So come and find Loop Deck stand and you'll probably find me there. We can have a chat and I hope to see you there. Anyway, I'll see you on another one very, very soon. I'm Adam. This is First Man Photography, out. <laughs>